Welcome to Bloomberg's Davos Debate. I'm Francine Lacroix, and we're talking China. Over the next 75 minutes, we ask, where is the Chinese economy headed with the new five-year plan being presented in 2016? How can the world's second largest economy shift gears without stalling its growth engine? And what does all the market volatility tell us about the perception of China and, of course, the task facing Chinese regulators? Well, we have, I'm very pleased to say, an A-star panel. Thank you so much for coming on. Jean Zhang Xing, he's chairman of the board, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. Christine Lagarde, managing director at the IMF. Fang Xinghai, vice chairman, China Securities Regulatory Commission, of course, director general at the Intercontinental Economic Department. Gary Cohn, uh, president at Goldman Sachs. Zhang Xing, of course, chief executive officer and co-founder at Soho China. And Ray Dalio, chairman and chief investment officer at Bridgewater's Associates. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, Chairman John, let me start off with you. China's markets, of course, have begun the year with a lot of volatility. What do you believe is the underlying cause of this? This <coughs> 啊，百分之六点九的一个增长，呃，已经公布的所有的一些经济指标，我觉得都是表明了中国经济依然是世界经济增长的引擎。啊，去年对世界经济的增长的贡献差不多是四分之一吧。那么呢，当然了，这个今
a uh, normal balance of payments, economic, too much debt restructuring kind of recession. Um, in Japan, they used to define a recession as anything less than 3% growth. Maybe in China, they'll describe a recession as less than 5% growth. We're going through that. I think it's being confused with the longer term picture. In other words, I think that the reforms that are going on in China and the leadership in China in terms of where it's moving is going to be very fundamentally good. And so you're looking at something that is a short-term challenge as distinct from something of where we will be in five years after the uh, regeneration of new capital markets and new economy with uh, vibrant young entrepreneurs and that other economy that's now beginning to flourish. But, but why have we had so much volatility since the start of the year? Well, the volatility has been primarily as a, a result of, in the world as a whole, that we have an ease of easing of monetary policy all around the world. And we're not going to have the same effectiveness in that easing of monetary policy. Because with interest rates at zero, you can't cut interest rates. And with asset prices, having risen because of that quantitative easing, there is risk, the risk premiums have gone down and there's a big vulnerability. So when China is dealing with the rest of the world, China is a negative on the margin for the rest of the world. And the world is vulnerable because of the lack of monetary policy while asset prices are comparatively high. Mr. Fang, how do you explain the volatility? Is it you know, something that we just need to learn to live with? Well, um Maybe there are you know, two factors that are going on. One is that um, China is in the midst of uh, transiting from an economy relying heavily on investment and exports to an economy uh, a lot more dependent on domestic consumption. And in this transition, a lot of assets get revalued in the process. So I think this is you know, the primary reason lying behind uh, volatility. Now, another factor is that, you know, I mean, the Fed raised interest rates not long ago. Uh, a lot of emerging markets uh, didn't, uh, you know, perform very well. Uh, their domestic reforms got stored. Uh, so you have a combination of, uh, you know, Chinese transition plus uh, international uh, influx. Um, and that caused volatilities. Now, you ask why a lot of volatilities right at the beginning of the year. Well, asset price adjustments usually went by steps, right? It does not go always smoothly. And we just you know, hit that step at the beginning of this year. Madame Lagarde, if you look at the fluctuation, what have we learned? What have, is, is there something that we have learned about what the Chinese are trying to do in the last two weeks? You know, at, at the IMF, we don't look at the last two weeks. So I'm a little <laughs> bit embarrassed to, <laughs> to comment on the last two weeks. And if, if you don't mind, I'd like to just go back to um, more basics. It is a fact, as has been indicated, that the second or first, depending on how you calculate um, GDP, that the second or first largest economy in the world is going through a list of transitions. Uh, Ray has indicated that. You have indicated that as well. Um, you know industry to service, export to consumption, lower level of investment, hopefully. Uh, and uh, I think there's another one which, has, which is happening at the moment, which is also a governance change, uh, which has begun, which is probably going to continue to roll out, which has to do with the anti-corruption fight that President Xi has highlighted as one of his, uh, his, his, his key proposals, which has to sort of trickle all the way down to the provinces. And that is also a management change which, which uh, has to be um, taken into account by Chinese authorities, Chinese operators, so that risk can be apprehended, risks can be taken in spite of this, of this happening. I would say also that given those massive transitions that are undertaken pretty much at the same time uh, and, and accepted as such, uh, there is a communication issue uh, which you know, it's, it's something that markets do not like. Uncertainty, uh, not knowing exactly what the policy is, not knowing exactly against what the renminbi is going to be uh, valued. Is it the dollar? Is it a basket of currencies? Which basket is it going to be? On the, I think on the balance of payment and on, on the exchange rate matter, I think better and more communication would certainly serve that transition uh, better. 
I tend to agree with, with um, Mr. Dalio's uh, assessment, but from our perspective, we believe that all those changes are perfectly manageable if the right policies are uh, taken and given the large amount of reserves, the large amount of buffers that the country has. So from our perspective, we are you know, forecasting a, a 65 uh, growth rate for next year, mm -hmm. and we believe that uh, the Chinese authorities can perfectly legitimately accept that this growth rate is fine for China, just as it is fine for the exchange rate to be aligned with the basket of currencies. Gary, does China actually need to decide whether they are a free market economy or not, or have they decided but not communicated enough? So, so look, I, I agree with everything our panelists have said so far. I mean, many of these fundamental transition points that China's going through are real. When you go from a, um, when you go from a CapEx economy where you're building infrastructure to an OpEx economy where you're basically having consumers drive your economy, that's a long transition. You cannot you know, monitor or affect consumer discretionary spending. It's called consumer discretionary spending. You can't affect it the way you can affect government spending. So this transition is, is difficult. On the, the specific question of China's economy and, and whether it's a market-based economy, you know, clearly this is a question that the market in the market as a whole is dealing with. Um, there have been signs that China wants to have an open, free economy, an open, free marketplace. Um, but in, in certain situations, the Chinese have intervened into their market, making it less than a free and open market. Now, I must remind everyone that many of the things that the Chinese have done in intervening in their market are the exact replicas that many other countries, including the United States, have done at certain parts in their modern history, not even in their old history, uh, whether it be circuit breakers or you know, restrictions on certain, certain type of trading activity. So I agree with um, Madame Lagarde, who, who basically said, you know, it's a communication issue. Hmm. You know, the communication is really what's important here. Communicating what the Chinese market is going to be and yeah. sticking with that theory, no matter how painful it is in the transition. Transitions are very difficult and you've got to stick through the transition. Zhang how difficult is communication when you're dealing with such a huge and complex economy? Uh, what we, I come from the real economy side, yeah. you know, being a real estate developer. So what I see is uh, that there's a total decoupled between the stock market trading the stocks of the real estate developer, which is hugely discounted, uh, and the real economy where we see that the easing uh, of the monetary policy is actually uh, pushing the asset price up. And, and so that's on the one side. And also in terms of transition from investment-driven economy to consumption-driven economy, for real estate, it means that we used to build buildings, Today, we just manage the leasing. And in terms of leasing, actually is going quite well, at least in the cities I operate in Beijing and Shanghai. We're seeing a massive take up of new space from internet companies, mostly internet companies. Uh, we're seeing not so much new take up from the old economy, like non-internet traditional economy. But by and large, we have new buildings coming up to the market almost every other month, and they've all been taken up. We haven't seen a single building sitting there empty, not being taken up. So I think that there must be a communication issue, because on the one hand, the real economy seems to be doing OK. But on the other hand, the stock market is trading at a huge discount. And uh, obviously, the investors are not getting the same message as we operating the economy is doing. Uh, Chairman Jen, again, to this point of transparency, what the markets understand. In 2013, China, of course, promised to give the market a decisive role in the economy. And then since we've had uh, intervention in both the currency, but also the stock markets, when do you foresee China making good on its pledge? Hmm. <laughs> 
市场呢，讲在这个经济的这种配置中间，要起到决定性的和基础性的这个作用。那么刚才讲到了，我也想讲一讲关于沟通的问题了，这是确实是一个非常重要的问题。当我们这个经济在产生巨大变化的时候，呃，有很多的方面，我觉得需需要沟通。这个沟通就是一个您刚才说的一个透明度。那么实际上，中国的经济，呃呃，在。过去的几年中，已经产生了非常大的变化。呃，大家非常过去，大家经常对中国提出：“哎，你的投资比例太高啦，你这个投资驱动啊，你这个第二产业，这个你的第三产业应该发展啊，等等。”其实，在去年的中国已经出现了这样的情况啊，这个消费已经对经济的这个推动已经达到了这个百分之六十六啊。刚才那个。呃，这个我们张欣女士讲到了这个房地产的市场，大家看到一方面看到了房地产的这一些的这个过剩，啊，第二，去年房地产的实际的增长只占了这个固定资产投资的比重的百分之十左右，啊，它对总的投资中间只增长百分之一，但是呢，房地产的这个消费这一块却增长的非常快，像工商银行，我举个例子，我们去年。百分之六十二的新增贷款是用在以房地产个人按揭贷款为主的消费贷款，说明这个经济有巨大的强大这样的活力。但是所有的这一些变化，我觉得要加强沟通。现在的信息的这种不对称的情况依然是非常的严重。呃，一些好的消息甚至会被解读为一些坏的消息啊。有些消息呢，这个这个呃一些。变化，大家还习惯于用一种旧常态的眼光或者这种分析来做。那么，所以呢，我想呢，对中国来说，在走向这一种新常态情况下面，加强沟通，对中国来说，我觉得是一个考验。怎么样能够更好的运用一种预期的管理，来事先来调节啊这个市场的一种变化？我想呢，中国会在这一些的波动中间，我们会学习到很多，将来也会越来越成熟的。Uh, yeah, I, I think there are there are three issues、um, here. One is communication,、uh, as Christy just said.、Um, the other is that, you know, is there a strategy, a real strategy, to transit from a、uh, Investment-led economy to a consumer、uh, consumption-led economy. The third issue is that you know, some people、uh, question、uh, the execution of the strategy.、Right? Now, volatilities by themselves should not be、uh, worrisome for people like Gary and Ray. You know, who know volatility and Chairman Jiang as well. Right? Who they know volatilities very well. It's the three issues behind the volatilities. That somehow、uh, have worried、uh, a lot of international investors.、Uh, in terms of communication,、uh, you're right. You know, we should do a better job, and we are learning, and uh, uh, and we are doing it. I'm here today to communicate. <laughs> 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 and、uh, but you know, we have to be patient because our system is not structured in a way right, that can communicate or is, you know.、Uh, Able to communicate seamlessly with the market,、uh, we are learning, right? And uh, uh, China can learn. Okay, I can assure you that. In terms of strategy, I think there is a strategy,、uh, and it's the right strategy, and that is to reduce investment, right? To expand consumption, to shift more income, you know, from the state-owned sector to the pockets of consumers,、um, and to do what we call.、Um, Supply-side structural reform, and the purpose of that reform is to make our supply side of the economy a lot more responsive to consumer demands. Because right now in China, you know, it is not that consumers are not there; they are there. They are demanding a lot of goods and services, but the supply side of the economy is not providing them at a reasonable price. And healthcare, you know, education, entertainment. High-quality consumer goods. You can point it to everything. So there, it lies a lot of opportunity. Then、um, execution. Now, is China really transiting from 
uh, a consumer, uh, a investment-led economy to a consumer-led economy. I mean, if you read Martin Wolf yesterday in the Financial Times piece, Martin is a good friend of mine. He seems to be saying that China is not transiting at all. You know, the economy still relies very much on investment uh, uh, for growth. Now, on that score, I uh, disagree with him. Uh, investment as a share of GDP is shrinking, mm -hmm. and consumption, right, domestic consumption as a share of GDP is increasing. It reached 52.2%, 52.5% .2%, uh, 52 last year, and five years ago, it was only 49%. Now, people say, oh my goodness, you know, 3% shift is just not large enough. I agree, it could be faster, it could be bigger, but you know, we are moving uh, to the right direction. And ultimately, when you look at a country and decide you know, your views about the country, you look at two things. One is the fundamentals, the economic fundamentals that the country uh, has. Saving, education, right? you know, hard working, uh, innovation, whatever. The other thing is you look at the leadership. Right? If you have a strong leadership, you have confidence in the country. If the country has a weak leadership, you know, despite very good economic fundamentals, the performance will not be good. And if you look at China's leadership, I think you know, we have the strongest leadership in the world at this point. Mr. Frank, a, a, question, a question on, on regulation, and then I want to get to, to Ray and Dalyu. Um, last week, the chairman of China's stock regulator said there has been a staff exodus, exodus and he was basically indicating that the department was um, having trouble keeping up with market sophistication. Is the market getting too complex for China uh, to regulate properly? Because this is what th these, people are concerned about. I, I understand about. what you're saying. These are short-term challenges. Uh, I mean, China has the talent. I mean, you have so many people going to universities, going to graduate schools, going to you know, good Chinese universities, going to good Western universities. Uh, we have the people. Uh, and uh, uh, government service, public service, still carries a very high esteem in China. Uh, so I have no doubt that we have the talent. Uh, the market, of course, has gotten a lot more complex, right? And uh, sometimes, you know, we uh, don't know how to deal with the market very well yet. But, I mean, you, know, you bet, we can learn. Gary? So, so look, Francine, you, st you started out talking about the whole question of volatility. And we, we morphed onto this discussion of, of communication and free markets. And I think these, these two concepts go together. Um, and so when you look at it, what's going on in China and the Chinese trying to move to more of a free market and this inability to communicate more freely, that's somewhat where you're generating the volatility. You know, the, the, the world standards today for publicly listed companies and publicly listed disclosure on you know, balance sheets, audited financial statements, corporate governance is pretty high and getting higher everywhere in the world. You know, people, investors, capital is fungible around the world. Capital moves at the speed of light today. People want access to Chinese companies. They want Chinese companies held to the same standards. Number two is they, they want the marketplace to determine which Chinese companies should have access to capital, not the Chinese themselves deciding which companies should have access to capital. So as the Chinese market opens up and becomes more freer, the marketplace will determine which Chinese companies should be public and which ones shouldn't be public. And to the extent you start getting more you know, world accepted financial statements, corporate governance, and the market determining which companies will be public and which companies won't be public, I think you will dampen volatility. So a little bit of this is just natural evolution and part of the communication problem as you're evolving a market real time. Unfortunately for the Chinese, they're doing this in 2014, 15, and 16 in a digital era. They're not doing this in the 1930s when we, didn't, when we had a telegraphic era. They, we did, you know, the West, rest of the world did it in an analog world. They're doing it in a digital world. So we're, we're watching it real time. They're also doing it in an era when we g just got through you know, re-regulating all of the financial institutions around the world, and we've taken an enormous amount of liquidity out of the markets, and the Chinese are suffering from this lack of liquidity that exists out there. 
I, I think that the Chinese policymakers are not getting nearly as much credit as they deserve. And I have the benefit of seeing it from the outside. So I'm not speaking from a Chinese perspective. I think you have to get into the nitty gritty of what they're going through. So let's say a debt restructuring. If you take a look at the debt restructuring that they're having to go through, just to put that in perspective, local government debt, local government spending counts for about 30% of GDP. It's running a deficit, funding deficit, of about 20%. That means if you cut that funding deficit, that's about 6% of GDP, a hacking of 6% GDP. If you look at the way that that has been restructured um, and managed, it's been managed really superbly. It's a very difficult situation because you're in a situation where if you just restructure and you don't provide those capital, all of that spending that is taking place through there won't take place. So, and the same people who are doing that restructuring are the same people who did it in 98 with Ju Ranji. They're the same experienced people. If you know the mechanisms, the type of mechanisms literally to be using these things, they're pursuing that. If you look at the economic restructuring, in other words, they're going from one economy, basically it was like five banks lends to state-owned enterprises and lends to local governments. Okay, the development of a shadow lending system, that's been done with a lot of balance. Because, in other words, it's a risky situation, but the free exchange of capital in a certain way is getting capital to companies that never would have had access to capital before. And that's not producing a volatility. That's quite an accomplishment. And if you look at, okay, the balance of payments. The balance of payments is a very difficult situation. It, it, capital flows are what the capital flows are. And if you look at how they're handling it, I think in terms of the stock market handling it, there have been problems. And you know, there, some of the responses have not been by world standards. But there was also a big order imbalance. In other words, when the order hit and everybody wants to sell, and then they have to respond quickly, there was that sort of circumstances. When I speak to those policymakers and I speak to those in the West, I find equal levels of, or, or even better sometimes, equal levels of competence in terms of dealing with the things that they're dealing with. I would say that if you compare also the politics of the government, uh, there, is, there are no loose cannons that are going to be running China. I mean, these are people, if you look at the system, of how it has to be chosen and how you get to there. You have to be a competent leader and devoted to the country. If you look at the politics in the West, and we look at some of the you know, leadership there, that could be quite scary. <laughs> <laughs> so I, th I think this commitment, I think the commitment to market reforms is a very real commitment to market reforms. In other words, and, and think of the power that that's going to have to liberalize that economy. Basically, it's been an economy with the money clogged at the top. Top 10% is where it's pa passing through. This will circulate, and there's a new China. You could speak to that new China, the new board and the, the entrepreneurship. So I think we're going through a cyclical, you, you can't help but go over that cyclical adjustment, and that'll last probably maybe two or three years. It comes at a bad time for the rest of the world because when you look at its impact on commodity prices and then not only just commodity prices, the other economies of Brazil and so on, and you look at the vulnerability of the rest of the world in terms of monetary policy, that's a bad combination. But we'll get past this, I think, in terms of China. A bad year in China is going to be a great year in almost any other country. <laughs> Madame Lagarde, do you question at all their commitment to structural reform, and what are the dangers if these structural reforms are not being pushed through? You know, we, we went through a couple of years of very intense uh, discussions with the Chinese authorities uh, because we were going to review the composition of the special drawing right basket of currencies, uh, which defined the value of the uh, special drawing rights, which is that sort of elusive currency of the IMF, which central banks around the world use. And, you know, if you had asked me whether the Chinese authorities would actually complete the reforms that they had to undertake in order to satisfy the criteria of that freely usable currency, I would have said, I don't think so. Yet, when the authorities actually put their mind and are determined to develop a strategy, implement reforms, certainly we've seen in that particular case an absolute, I wouldn't say perfection, nothing is perfect in this world, but an unbelievable determination and ability to deliver what, frankly, many would have considered as undeliverable to begin with. So if the same determination is applied in relation to the reform of state-owned enterprises, for instance, uh, in relation to the uh, 
the, the clarity of messages concerning the transitions that are at play at the moment, clarity of communication concerning uh, the macroeconomic framework within which they will define their policies going forward, even if the growth rate is not at seven-ish percent and closer to you know anywhere between six and six point five, I think that that will it will take a, a little bit of time, as 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 was said earlier. But uh, we believe that uh, they, they will deliver. It's a massive undertaking, let's face it. And just reforming the state-owned enterprises is going to require you know, a, fund, a special fund allocated to dealing with the issues. They've done that in the past already with certain sectors. And I have no doubt that as it is part of the exercise, just like the supply-side reforms that is the buzzword at the moment in, in, uh, in Beijing, it, it will happen. Chairman Jen, there is commitment because last month we had a mysterious authoritative person quoted by the People's uh, Daily uh, saying that China must get used to the L-shaped recovery unless reform is pushed through now. What are the dangers of, of waiting too long? This is a change for 因为中国要跨过这个中等收入的陷阱表面大家看到可能经济的增长速度是有点下行那么不再像过去这样简单的依靠投资和要素的驱动要更多的依靠创新来驱动在这一场改革中间会出动很多东西像结构改革确实不是一件非常容易的事情那么结构改革最近中国强调了这个进行供给值的一些改革那么这个改
It's also an understandable circumstance because changing that rate abruptly will have a negative effect on the economy. Um, I think the, um, the issue of instability is more of a balance of payments currency issue. That, that becomes one that I'm more concerned about. Um, that might uh, require more, you know, more of an adjustment uh, in the currency. And that, that adjustment in the currency would have an effect on the rest of the world, which would also transmit deflationary pressures to the rest of the world, because those exchange rates would essentially appreciate. And that has an effect um, at a time when there is a weakness in the rest of the world. We have to look at the impact that China has on the rest of the world and the rest of the world has on China, and the fact that there is not much of an effectiveness in monetary policy. Those two things combined create for a risky situation. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are a lot of issues that, uh, that I can address in this short period of time. But let me pick uh, two. One is that, uh, you know, for seeing when you mentioned the stock market volatility and then currency uh, volatility at the start of this year, uh, I would like to suggest that you know, stock market volatility should not be something that people should be so concerned with. Because even at yeah, today's level, which I was told the Shanghai stock market declined by about 2%, uh, it's now standing at around 2,900. Uh, it's 40% down you know, from the peak, but it's still 30% up from a year and a half ago. And valuation is still very rich. Uh, and since the stock market is, is, is rather isolated from the outside world, you know, the impact um, on the outside world is very minimal. Currency volatility is something, yes, you should pay attention to. And since uh, Ms. Lagarde is here, I just would like to say a few words on that. Um, China used to have a, what we call a crawling pack right, against the US dollar. Now the stated goal is to move toward a basket approach. And that approach is a serious approach. It's not something that we just say, it, we do it now. People, when they look at the actual uh, daily movement, they think, my goodness, what is the PBOC doing? You know, sometimes they kind of move back to crawling pack. Um, I think there's, you know, I mean, you should not focus the central bank's strategy too much on, on just you know, a few days' movement. If you look at the strategy over a period of, say, half a year or a year, you will realize that moving toward the basket approach uh, is the decided policy of China. Now, uh, the RMB appreciated quite a lot against the US dollar during the last few years, right? And passed prior on, you know, to the RMB joining uh, the SDR. So you have a little bit what we call catch up to do in terms of US dollar RMB exchange rate. But once we've done the visit, uh, you know, the rate, when measured against a basket of currencies, would be quite stable. And there's really no basis for China to depreciate the currency. Because if you look at you know, our fundamentals of the economy, we still have a very sizable current account surplus. Right? The economy is growing at about 6.5%. These are not a combination for a deep depreciation of the currency. And no matter what, depreciation of the currency is not in the interest of China in terms of carrying out our transition strategy. Right, because they, you know, too cheap currency is not for good, good for domestic consumption. Uh, and uh, uh, we thank the IMF for, uh, you know, working to uh, admit uh, the RMB into the SDR. Uh, some people uh, worry that, you know, once China enters into the SDR, it may not fulfill all the commitment with respect to joining the SDR. I can assure you that worry is completely unnecessary. China's record of uh, you know, honoring international commitment is superb, and we intended to honor all the commitments with regard to joining uh, the SDR. Uh, so that's the issue on, on currency. Very briefly on debt and, and financial, <laughs> the dreaded word crisis. Um, you will see volatilities you know, in Chinese market uh, going forward, but can the government deal with it? I think we will. We, we are able to deal with it. We can because you know, our structure of the government is such that the response to any 
uh, financial risk. It's very swift. The decision is decisive, and we want to make sure that you know, we deal with the issues when the issues are not very big. Right? Uh, and again, it always comes down to leadership. When you have steady, strong leadership, we will be able to deal with it. Uh, will there be volatilities? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Just a, a couple of things that I would like to mention in response to, uh, to uh, your points. You know, in a way, having a certain degree of volatility is, is all right, and it's compatible with this um, market-driven principles that China is, is adhering to. And you know, when you say governments can, can manage volatility, if volatility becomes excessive, yes, uh, intervening is, is, is legitimate. But a degree of volatility is, is okay. As, as Gary mentioned earlier, uh, market sort, sorts out things eventually. Um, not that it's, you know, primus in their paris, but, but there, should, there should be at least an acceptance of the fact that there will be some and, 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 and it, there should be some. The second point on, on, in relation to exchange uh, rate and the, and the currency, I think you're completely right. And I think that this, this illusory, illusionary pegging against the dollar has to be dismissed. There is a basket of currency. Uh, in, uh, in effective term, the renminbi has been quite stable against that basket of currency. And not just now, but for the last few months. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that should be just acknowledged, understood by markets. And this, this complaint that there is depreciation against one currency no, you're doing that against a basket of currency which includes the trading partners of China. Um, so, yes. and again, communication on that one, I think, is, is an important point. So I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that China's built its massive reserve not because of monetary policy, because of the last 30 years of incredible reforms, and is really driven by the incredible entrepreneurship and largely driven by private sector. So I think the government's commitment to continuous reform and continuously to support the private sector is important. Now, as Mr. Fang is here, I'd like to just remind you that the promise of the fourth board of a NASDAQ style of a stock exchange that would enable the small to medium-sized enterprises to be listed to get uh, funding without producing profit, because a lot of the companies listed on NASDAQ are not producing profit, remember. And today, in China, if you, are a, uh, if you are a Amazon, and if you do not, it, you can be as good as Amazon, but if you do not produce profit, you are not qualified to be listed. Now, that commitment has to be, uh, you know, has to be kept. And I think that was... Uh, the, the government came out, the policymakers talk a lot about the fourth board is going to come out. We'd love to see it coming out, as promised, probably the fourth quarter of this year. I have a company, I needed to float it, and I'm expecting you to come out with the good news. <laughs> there you go. Um, I hear it. <laughs> quickly, back to the currencies. Chairman Jan and then Gary, I'll, I'll ask you the same question. Have policy, have Chinese policymakers actually done enough to re reverse this market consensus that the yuan will devaluate?这个根本的决定一个货币决定一个汇率的所以我想中国的经济运行依然相比全球来说依然是高位运行这个行程机制产生了一些变化 
，这个呢，我觉得对中国很多人都还不完全理解，那或者对信息还掌握还不够充分，对全世界更是如此。所以在这样的情况下面，我想呢，很多人的惯性，他还是以人民币盯美元来做他这一个。这个汇率形成的判断的，这也是我觉得最近一段时间人民币啊有些波动的一些原因之一。当然了，我们也看到了，就是美元加息以后的这个一出效应啊，对不仅对中国对新兴市场汇率的这一种影响。但是呢，我觉得这一种一出效应，可能未来也会带来回忆的效应的，因为现在各国的大家可以看到，不仅是大宗商品价行，这个这个汇率下行。一定程度上，可能各国的外汇储备也在下行，这样外汇储备下行的结果，可能会推动美元的中长期的这个国债的这个价格，这样又带来的一个新的一个全球的一个一个一个在金融方面的，包括对美国的经济复苏和金融方面的一些问题。所以我想呢，最后经济还会会平衡的。所以怎么样能够尽快让这个汇率能够稳定下来？我想还有加强投资者的教育和沟通，我觉得是非常重要的。但我也觉得，就是我非常将来那个同意的，刚刚女士刚才说的啊，这个中央银行它的基本点，它是要依靠市场机制来推动汇率的形成。这一点，我觉得中国是坚定不移的要这样走的。特别是加入 S D R 以后，我想都是推动了汇率、人民币的汇率形成的市场化。但是呢，另外一方面，如果市场有过度的波动或者不理性的波动，中央银行露出它的牙齿和它的爪子来，我觉得也是应该的。So, so let me back up for t h seconds and recount where we were a year ago. A year ago, we were in a economic situation where there were three currencies in the world. That were willing to strengthen while the rest of the world was weakening. We had the Swiss franc, we had the RMB, we had the dollar. Literally a year ago, the Swiss National Bank decided that was not in their best interest. I think it was you know 52 weeks ago now that they decided that was not in their best interest. So they no longer were in that basket of currencies that was willing to be strong. Left the dollar and left the RMB.、Um, so if if you See where the world was through the end of 2015, 2016. You had a world of devaluers, economies trying to lower interest rate, devalue their currency, grow at the expense of other economies, and the two currencies that were willing to rally were the dollar and China and the RMB. Now they were linked to each other. It would make sense to me that if you were linked to a currency that's naturally rallying. Because you're you, you're you're the one not lowering your interest rates, that you would decouple from that currency,、um, and and become more competitive in the currency world, which is exactly what China's doing. Makes total rational sense to me. Most market participants continue to believe that China will devalue their currency further.、Um, this is one of the areas of volatility. You know how will the devaluation go? Will it be very, very, very slow?、Um, which I think most of us think it will be very slow and very methodical, and and you know take a long period of time. It will not be the the Swiss National Bank you know move the peg one night.、Um, but I think that the vast majority of market participants in their global equation of how they value economies and how they value <coughs> currency crosses. Would have China at a lower value currency by the end of 2016 than the spot value is today. Ray, how much do you worry about foreign exchange reserves? We understand figures that they dropped by half a trillion dollars last year. At what point does it become dangerous and actually self-inflict a, a confidence crisis?、Yeah. Um, I think it's you know I think it's a big issue.、Uh, the balance of payments imbalance is large, and as you're referring to, reflected in that.、Uh, The、uh, on the offshore rate in、um, uh, Hong Kong,、uh, the interest rate differentials are rising, so that's a negative for the economy. In an economy in which interest rates should be lowered, 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's a situation in which if you look at their past evaluations, um, roughly um, they've taken place between when there's a 10 to 30 percent decrease in reserves, there's been on average a 25 percent uh, devaluation. That's been in the past. So I think that those are things to pay attention to. Um, it's not always easy for governments to maintain clear control of their currency. Uh, Madame Lagarde, onto another point, because we actually also have some news. The IMF opened its uh, selection process uh, for the managing director uh, when your term <laughs> ends in July. You've had the support of both France and, and the UK. Do you want a second term? <laughs> <laughs> You will appreciate that I'll be waiting a little bit before I say anything about that. But thank you for the question. Do you, if, if you do get a second term, how much do you think we'll be talking about China in, in the next four years? Well, in the next, in, in the, in the next few years, um, you know, given the, the, the growth rate of that country and given the state of development is, it is at, I think we'll be talking a lot about China. It is one of the two largest economies in the world. If you define in PPP terms, uh, it is the largest economy in the world. So I think we would be crazy not to talk a lot about China. And the transformations that, that are at play at the moment uh, are going to be both fascinating and will matter a lot for the rest of the world. We've seen it over the summer. Surprise, surprise. But we're going to see it more going forward because there will be spillover effects in the vicinity because there is a China supply chain uh, we'll see it across the world as well. And any you know, significant reduction in the growth of the largest economy in the world or the second largest economy in the world, depending on how you calculate it, is obviously going to impact the rest of the global economy. From 2010 to 2015, growth rate uh, for China has fallen by four percentage points. Looking at 2020, what, what do you think, Mr. Vang, the growth rate will be? Oh, okay. Now, um Okay, let, let me, be, before you answer that, if I go may, ahead. you know, we keep, it's fascinating. People say, oh, China's growth has collapsed at 6.9%. Well, if we look at the output relative yeah. to what the output was back, you know, sort of six, seven years ago with a 12 or 13% growth rate, we have the same. So give us, a, no, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I understand that there's some concern about this current year in China. Right? Some people forecast that uh, because of the volatilities right, and so forth, uh, somehow you know, 2016 would be a very bad year for China. Growth rate will slow down dramatically. Uh, I don't think that will happen because in China, we cannot um, afford to let growth rate to drop too sharply because that will ignite a lot of financial problems inside China. So we will have a, what we call appropriately expansionary supportive fiscal and financial policy in this current year to make sure that growth rate is still uh, appropriate. Now, does China have the means to do so? Obviously, we have the means to do so, particularly on the fiscal side, and we can expand quite a lot, right? So there's just no worry for a somehow, you know, sharp decline of China's growth rate. Now, some people think, well, your 6.9% is perhaps just not accurate to begin with, right? Now, I, I admit, you know, our numbers can always be more right, perfect, more accurate. Uh, but let me give you a sort of supportive figure, and that is tax revenues in China last year went up by 6.6%. Right, so that's not very far away from the 6.9%, uh, uh, which means that you know, the figure is, is, is not far away from, from the truth. And Madam uh, Lagarde also mentioned uh, China's contributions to the rest of the world uh, remains extremely large, which is true. I mean, you, know, if you talk to all these uh, multinational uh, company CEOs uh, having business in China. Uh, most of them tell you that their business in China are still expanding quite, quite well. Uh, Ford Motors, for example, right? Ford is not the biggest car seller in China, but they sold 1.07 million cars in China last year. 1.07 you know, million, it's not a small number. So China remains a huge contribution to the rest of the world, and this is something that you know, uh, 
the rest of the world should appreciate a little bit more. <laughs> uh, Zhangshan, and you were pointing to something that also a, a lot of observers do underestimate, which is the strength of consumer spending and it's the strength of services. How resilient are those two w when you look at the Chinese economy? Well, I think the, still the, the, uh, the dynamic force for the Chinese economy is its entrepreneurialism and its private sector, and especially the small to medium-sized companies not the gigantic SOEs are, even though they command a lot of power, but it is the millions and millions of the SOEs that matter the most. And I think in that regard, uh, the reforms still need to be more focused on giving them the support, whether it's a capital market support or uh, tax support, monetary support. Those are uh, uh, very important for the continuous growth because that will continue to be the growth engine for China. And now from where I sit, I see incredible innovation coming from the young internet, mobile companies. And that really is, a, is an exciting part of our e economy that very rarely it gets featured into the news because uh, we talk so much about the market volatility and so on. In fact, most of these SOEs don't even get a chance to participate in the volatility. <laughs> and I think it's important that we remember that, uh, especially the policymakers like Mr. Fan, and uh, important to include these SO, SO, uh, 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 SMEs, and they would uh, reduce your volatility. <laughs> Mr. Fang, a comment? You take. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I agree that you know the SO, uh, SME. not SO, the SMEs. <laughs> Uh, are a great contributor uh, to Chinese growth. And our, our stock market um, should have done a lot more to support growth. Uh, it is doing quite a lot, by the way. I mean, just take last year, right? People focused so much on the, you know, sort of the gyrations in the stock market last year. But last year, the Chinese stock market raised 1.4 trillion RMB in equity money for the Chinese companies. Mm. That placed the Chinese stock market number one in the world in terms of equity uh, raised. But we can, you know, we can certainly do much better. And just one you know, very short sentence about um, financial risk. China is different from uh, other developing countries in the sense our growth is largely fueled by domestic savings, by domestic capital. Right? That gave us a confidence in our ability to deal with whatever volatilities, you know, risks is coming out of the financial market. If China was a country relying largely on foreign capital for growth, you bet, you know, any, any um, major financial uh, risk can derail uh, our growth. But China is different. Now, this is a factor that, fact that you know, a lot of people should pay attention to. Um, Chairman Zhang, how inclusive will China's growth be in the future?这个我想要谈两个方面吧一个接着这个张新女士刚才讲的中小企业的问题我想呢关注中小企业的成长对中国尤为重要因为中小企业充满了巨大的这个增长的这个潜力和活力而且它是解决就业的一个最重要的一个
。当然，我们是以环保部门的这个他们的这个呃评价是为我们的标准的。任何的企业只要环保不符合，我们坚决的否定。所以呢，我想呢，这个我们需要的是更加包容的成长，我们需要一个更加美好的一个世界。那是。这样哈，我是我们中国的经济的发展，我想我们就能够取得一个将来更好的一个人们更欢迎的这么一个效果。Right, following on from that, with global trade stagnant, with global trade stagnant, when or will China take the role that the U.S. has had for years in spurring demand? I don't think we're going to see that for three years or more.、Um, we're going to see a、um, China is going through this adjustment process, and it'll be,、uh, I think, a three-year type of adjustment process. It's the equivalent a lot of these structural things. So it's going to be a negative on the on the margin, a negative for world economy, and that passes through to emerging countries, particularly those that have a dependence on exports to China or. Have commodities, and then that is passing through,、um, in turn, to a number of countries. So there's a there's a world deflationary pressure that exists, and that's and, and that's why when we think about、uh, the Fed's policies,、uh, Fed's policies, there's not a country in the world that should not ease its monetary policies. Maybe some should stay pat. Maybe the UK should stay pat. Maybe, but by and large, we have that. Self-reinforcing、uh, negative circumstance in terms of growth that uh, is um, a problem because the rest of the world also、uh, re represents a weakening in force force for China, for the exports, for their demand. That that is also weakening. So、um, I don't think that we're. I think the question will be where is the locomotive. Where is it, and what does it mean for Fed policy? Look at if you look at these deflationary pressures coming from a possible yuan devaluation from oil. What? How does Janet Yellen look at this? I, th I think I think the Federal Reserve thinks of a, the business cycle.、Um, you know, a classic business cycle is that when your demand is increasing faster than your capacity. And you're at a fairly high level of capacity. Unemployment rates are low. GDP gap is fairly tight. You should tighten monetary policy, and that's the policy I think that's overriding the Fed's issue. I think they're paying too much attention to the business cycle and not enough attention to the long-term debt cycle. There is a long-term debt cycle that you can't squeeze much more out of this because of the lower interest rates and that. And so we're seeing that the world that they're Getting feedback about is a deflating world with asset prices coming down, and I hope that they'll remain flexible in their thinking of monetary policy. Be hesitant. There's asymmetric risks because there's no doubt that the Federal Reserve can be effective in tightening monetary policy.、Mm -hmm. So if they're a little bit late and then they tighten monetary policy, I don't think that's a problem. But they're not as effective in easing monetary policy. The pushing on a string, like in the 1935 period, is a, is a real issue. And so, what they have to do is more wait for the eyes of and the whites of the eyes of inflation before they、um, err on that. Because I don't think it's going to be so easy to be、yeah. stimulative and move to quantitative easing and create that reversal. Gary, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I do agree with that.、Um, I, I think that you know. One of the new paradigms, again, going back to this digital world we live in versus the analog world, a lot of the Fed policy that we're relying upon is analog policy. I mean, it's the it's the same policy we've had for generations and generations and generations. The world we live in today is completely digitized, meaning that we're real time. We've got a global workforce today. We've got global free movement of currency. Anyone with a handheld digital device, one of those, can can move any amount of currency they want around the world. Can trade any bond they want around the world. So you know, fixating on employment in the United States is interesting, but we've been unable to create wage inflation now for multiple years. Where the Fed has told us multiple times that it will come. Um, every year it will come, 
But in some respects, when you think of a globalized workforce today, which I think we have a globalized workforce and China is part of our globalized workforce, if you can go hire the incremental worker for less money in China than you can in the United States, where does the wage price inflation come from? And I think we're seeing that in the numbers. We see that we can create jobs in the United States, but we can't create jobs that pay real money. Um, and, and you take most companies that we represent or clients of ours, and we talk to them about how they're running their company, they will talk to me or they will talk to our representatives about how they're optimizing their workforce. Um, how they're moving jobs to Bangalore, how they're moving jobs and opportunities to China, how they're moving jobs or opportunities to Warsaw, Poland, because these are places where they can hire workers at huge discounts relative to a London, a Hong Kong, a New York. And so therefore, to the extent that they would have to pay incrementally more for the next worker, they'll export the job. And so I agree with Ray. Until you see the reality of this inflation in the system, I'm not sure assuming it's coming is a good assumption. We're almost running out of time, so I'm just going to ask each of you um, to give me your best advice or best prescription to try and bridge the divide that we were talking about between making market perception and what the policymakers in China want. Chairman Zhan. This <laughs> 这个我们这种这个剧烈的波动市场的剧烈的波动会尽快的会缩小它的波动啊这个同时呢我也希望啊中国呢能够这个顺利的实施我们的结构的改革这个调整啊能够顺利的跨过这个中等收入的现金 Thank you, Madam Lagarde. I would say, number one, clarity of communication. Uh, I would say, number two, clarity of purpose. And I would say, number three, implementation of the reforms that have been identified. Uh, and for all of us, a bit of patience with the massive undertaking. But in regard, Germany has also just backed you for a second term. So can, can you say a comment that you would at least consider it? I'm, I'm getting did, breaking I'm, news. I'm, look, I'm honored. <laughs> I, I'm very grateful. And I'm extremely, um, you know, Pleased to hear that, and, and I, I thank you. I thank those who have uh, come out like that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, Mr. Feinfeld. Ray just said that China is on the margin a negative contributor to world growth. I was thinking who in your mind would be a positive contributor <laughs> on the margin to world growth? Uh, what I, just to be clear, what I'm saying is that the, as the rate of growth slows and the complexion of the economy changes, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. On the margin, that's a negative to growth. I, I don't I, I, think right now, I, I don't think that we have a locomotive. I think that with yeah, the exchange rate rising in the United States and also with the negative wealth effect that we're going to have because of the stock market going down, that we're going to, even in the United States, experience a lower level of growth. That's, so that's, I don't. Uh, my exactly, concern is that we don't see, have a, a locomotive. That's what I wanted to, to say as well. In this world, in fact, um, you know, we have to all the major countries, right, major economies, perhaps simply have to uh, work together a lot more, and you know, cooperate a lot more in terms of policies, understand each other a lot more in terms of overcoming our respective domestic difficulties. And realize that, you know, we are, I mean, the economy is globalized, we are all on the same boat, and uh, we just have to you know, cooperate a lot more closely to overcome this soft patch going forward. And just to follow through of that, would that be monetary policy cooperation? Would that be fiscal policy cooperation? In what form will that cooperation take? <laughs> all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Madam just told me. <laughs> It'll be a challenge. It is. But, you know, uh, just to uh, add one sentence, you know, one sentence that is, in terms of U.S.-China cooperations, monetary policy, and other issues, uh, we are working very well with our U.S. counterparts. Right. A, a challenge, but doable. 
you're confident this will be done? I, I think monetary policies is not going to be as effective. That's a big change in the world because we've required monetary policies to be effective. I think that's, and then I think on cooperation on monetary policies, I think that because you can't move interest rates as much, you move currencies more. So I think that we're entering an environment in which there will be more currency volatility as a means of easing policies where they need to be eased. And that smacks of currency wars, not as much currency cooperation. When I think of fiscal policy, I think fiscal policy is very politically sensitive. You know, you get into a bad economic situation and somebody will say you need to be fiscally more responsible and cut, and someone will say you need fiscal stimulus. And when there's political shifts, that, and particularly let's say the populism that's taking place in Europe or even in the United States, those things may not be easy decisions to make on fiscal policy. Gary, in 20 seconds. So I, I agree with Chairman Jang. I hope for China's success very much. I agree with Madam Lagarde. We all want clarity. I agree with the chairman's here that we, we, we're hoping for, for, for success in, in, in all the policy areas. The one area where I would just throw my two cents in is um, China seems to be more receptive, in, in your point, to more trade policies. And getting some of the trade policies done with the United States would be very beneficial for, for both and growing both economies. Xiang Xing, final words, 20 seconds. I think that uh, China is going through this transition period uh, and there's going to be a lot of volatility and noise. And it's important that the policymakers and the media are not focused only on the, uh, you know, the short-term noise, but committed to the long-term reforms. Thank you.